Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today I want to cover possibly the most important, but also least talked about part of any retro PC rig. I am of course meaning the humble PSU. The PSU is the heart of any computer, and if you get it wrong, it can lead to a huge number of issues, which I had to relearn just recently. Amazingly, even though this basic box still looks mostly the same, PSUs have actually changed quite a bit over the years. So let's take a look at three generations of computer to see what they require. And we have a 486, a Pentium 3, and an AMD 64. And before we do that, let's take a quick refresher course on exactly what a PSU is actually doing. And the best way of doing that? Well, checking out the label. Here's a label I found earlier, and as you can see, it has a number of voltages. We have 3.3, 5, 12, negative 5, and negative 12. Though as we'll see, not all power supplies will have all of the voltages. But what you will find is underneath, normally they will have an amp rating, which is the maximum amount of current each of these voltages can pull. And if we multiply these voltages by the ampage, you get the power rating in watts. And if you add them all together, it should come to roughly about the same value that your power supply has. And with that in mind, let's check out our first computer with the 486. Overall, the 486 won't actually need that much in the way of wattage from its power supply. Though you won't be able to just take a modern supply and just slap it in. These machines typically use the AT connector, which was also known as the P8P9 connector. Also, modern supplies don't tend to provide minus 5 volts. This is because most modern equipment doesn't use it, and thus it became an extra in the power spec. And as you can imagine, anything that's marked optional tends to get dropped as soon as the makers think it's possible. But if you do want to use a modern power supply, you can actually find harnesses that will convert the ATX standard to the AT. These come in two versions, the passive, which just directly passes the voltages on, and active, which will also create that negative 5 volt rail. Now it was only a limited number of cards that actually required it, so most of the time you can actually get away with a passive connector. The older PSUs were also directly connected to the power switch, so you'll have to connect the harness to that switch, or possibly replace it if the button doesn't easily allow you to connect to it. Thankfully, because of the lower power requirements and how easy it is to buy these converters, it's usually fine enough to buy a modern power supply and hook it up. Next up, we'll be looking at what is probably the most problematic machine I own, the Pentium 3. From a voltage point of view, it's actually quite simple. It doesn't really require that minus 5 volts, unless you're going to be running some legacy ISA cards. But from a current point of view, there is a big issue, as machines of this era were mostly powered by the 5 volt rail. And as such, depending on the hardware inside, it will want quite a lot of current from that rail. For example, this machine has two Voodoo cards, each of which will take quite a few amps, I think round about 5 to 10 amps each. On top of that, we also have a sound card, a third graphics card, as well as the CPU itself. So this will easily suck 20 to 30 amps alone. Now let's take a look at the power label of a modern power supply and oh, it's just 16 amps on the 5 volt rail. So where has all that power gone? Well, it's moved over to the 12 volt line. And while this generation mostly used the ATX power connector, many OEMs like Dell and Compaq either used custom pinouts for the connector or went with something completely different. So you may have problems just trying to power one of those boards, or it might lead to chips popping, as what happened with me. Because of these issues, finding a modern power supply for a Pentium 3 machine takes a lot of research, and it might actually be better to recap an older supply, or try and track down a new old stock model, like I did. And finally, let's look at a Pentium 4, well actually in this case it's an AMD 64, which is actually the easiest machine to work with, as for the most part power supplies haven't changed that much since this generation. If you buy a decent supply you should be absolutely fine. Though depending on the graphics card I would recommend trying to find a power supply with a single 12 volt rail, as you can find some supplies that will not provide all the current over a single 12 volt line. It will instead have multiple ones, which can be a real problem if you have a single device that requires a large amount of power. 
like the X1900 XT here. That required 30 amps. And there's also one other thing I need to mention that's common across all the machines, and that is the fan placement. Almost all modern power supplies have consolidated on a single 120mm fan, which is usually fitted on the top of the supply. Now depending on your case, this might be a real problem to try and fit, as naturally it will want to try and point up into the top of the case and have absolutely nowhere to vent the air. Also at the time of recording, new power supplies have just started to show up without any 5 or 3.3 volt rails at all. If this becomes the norm, then using a modern power supply might become a real issue with these older machines. Now I made this video because my Pentium 3 machine was massively unstable, and it was all down to the modern power supply that I put inside it. As soon as I replaced it with a new old stock model, that machine has been absolutely glorious. So hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. So until next time, I've been the Gouldfish, that was a highly charged episode, and this was Gouldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my episode, I hope you found it useful, and if you did, please let me know in the comments. Likewise, if I've made a mistake, please let me know as well, as I like to be as well informed as possible, but we all make mistakes.